microbiota is the total of all commensal or beneficial microbes in the gut. And the microbiome is the totality of all those microorganisms plus all of the genetic material contained within. And the microbiota, at least in humans, is composed of hundreds to upwards of a thousand different bacterial species. It hasn't been as extensively studied in other species. However, it, it really follows that they are going to have similar numbers of beneficial bacteria because particularly with canines, their digestive systems are somewhat similar to ours. Cats have a shorter digestive system, but they most certainly have a significant microbiome as well. The human microbiome actually contains about five times as many genes as the number of genes found in our actual human tissues and cells. In fact, 37% of our genes are the same as genes found in bacteria. This means that uh, through evolution, these genes have remained the same, though they're found now in very different organisms. Research has shown that there are 10 major phyla or families of beneficial bacteria within the GI tract of dogs and cats. At least five of these families are similar to the microbiome in humans, and these include Firmicutes, Bacterioides, Proteobacteria, Fusobacteria, and Actinobacteria. I know this graphic seems very busy, very confusing, but if you, if you look closely, I don't know if you can magnify it, but I want, just wanted to show all the different families and subfamilies within the different beneficial bacterial species. Some of these families contain some species which are beneficial and other species which actually are pathogenic or disease causing. So, just to briefly go over some of these uh, families, the Firmicutes includes the subfamilies of Lactobacillus, Clostridium, and Bacillus. Some of these may sound familiar. Bacterioides contains 10 different bacterioides species. Proteobacteria includes E. coli and Enterococcus species. Uh, Actinobacteria includes the subfamily Bifidobacterium. You've probably heard about that it's in a lot of different yogurts. And Fusobacterium, they're all just called Fusobacterium whatever. So what other organs have a microbiome? Well, the lungs and the upper respiratory system, the mouth, the skin, and the external urogenital tract all have their own certain segment of beneficial bacterial species or microbiome. What does the microbiome do? The microbiome really does a lot of things. It physically prevents growth of bad bacteria through competition for receptor space and nutrients. It protects the gut from invasion of pathogenic bacteria through the release of substances that deter their growth. It's important for proper development of the immune system. It helps to strengthen the barrier between the lumen or the tubes of the gut and the bloodstream. It induces secretion of IgA, which is a critical antibody for mucosal immunity or, or immunity involving the lining of the gut. It helps to maintain the tight junctions between the cells of the lining of the gut. Uh, in a syndrome known as leaky gut, these tight junctions are no longer tight, and they allow substances to get through that would not normally get through. And as a result, the immune system is activated and sensitized to these normally non-problem causing substances. The microbiome helps to control intestinal epithelial cell differentiation and proliferation. Sorry, my camera keeps cutting in and out, um, but this basically means it controls the growth of the cells lying in the gut. It uh, protects the body from dietary cancer causing substances by helping to metabolize them. It can synthesize or make certain B vitamins and vitamin K, as well as short chain fatty acids, which are important for GI function. It assists in digestion and detoxification by fermenting non digestible dietary residue substances in GI mucus. It assists in absorbing ions such as calcium, iron, and magnesium, which are important for proper muscle function in blood cells. And it helps to recoup potentially lost energy. And 
one other function is that it assists in control of the inflammatory and immune response within the gut through regulation of certain immune cells called Th17 cells and Treg cells. So it does a lot, a lot of things. Good thing. The gastrointestinal tract represents the largest surface area of the body that comes into direct contact with the external environment. The total surface area of the GI tract is greater than 200 times the surface of the skin. Because of this high surface area, the GI tract is in contact with many pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungi, allergens, prior to their being able to enter into the systemic circulation. If the GI system is out of balance due to dysbiosis, this can lead to a decreased ability to fight infection and or an increased recognition of commensals or self as foreign and can result in autoimmune conditions including pemphigus, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and of course allergies. What kinds of things cause dysbiosis? Well, either tension. I, have dog. I don't know what's happening with my camera. Really, really sorry. I see it keeps cutting out. Uh, processed diets, such as dry food. Antibiotics, very big one. And here I just want to uh, let you guys know about a little quote from a woman named Dr. Robin Chutkin. She's a well-known human integrative gastroenterologist. And she has said, after five days on antibiotics, your gut bacteria will be wiped out. And it could take years to come back. Other things that can cause dysbiosis are inflammation of the GI system, whether it be from parasites, bacteria, or viruses, and not receiving a good balance of bacteria in the perinatal period. Uh, animals that are, are born by C-section don't get the same exposure to bacteria as animals that are born naturally. What are the symptoms of dysbiosis? <laughs> Obviously, abnormal stool. Abnormal stool in any way can be a symptom of dysbiosis. It will be it soft, be it watery, be it formed but slimy, be it just very, very stinky. It possibly could indicate dysbiosis. Itchy skin, yeasty skin, that, that slightly sour odor where the skin feels kind of greasy. Recurrent infection even if they're outside of the GI tract. An overactive immune system, allergy, autoimmune conditions involving the skin or the GI tract, such as, again, IBD or in inflammatory bowel disease or pemphigus. And keep in mind that your dog or cat may have only very mild symptoms or sporadic symptoms, yet may still have an imbalanced gut. How can we test for dysbiosis? The good news is we definitely can. And there is a relatively new test run through Texas A&M University. And they do test it on poop. And they are looking for substances, or, sorry, substances produced by some of these potentially bad bacteria. We can also test for certain levels of B vitamins, particularly cobalamin and folate. And those can give us a little bit of a clue as to whether bad bacteria have, have overgrown. How can dysbiosis be treated? It's the whole point of the webinar, right? Finally getting to the point. Well, many products can be helpful for dysbiosis. Probiotics can help, but the best probiotics only contain about 20 or so bacterial species. And again, the reality is that there are hundreds of beneficial or commensal bacterial species within our pets and our own guts. And it's impossible to replicate them all. Fermented dairy products such as kefir and yogurt may help. Yogurt typically contains about one to five different bacterial strains and kefir contains somewhere around 30 strains. So that can be a pretty good choice, pretty good diversity. Other fermented products such as kimchi and kombucha Let's see, kimchi contains about 12 strains, and kombucha contains anywhere from 7 to 10 different strains. Um, these things taste a little funny, so I know that my dog wouldn't, wouldn't want to eat them. Maybe she'd eat a little yogurt, but I don't think 
most pets are going to really find these things too appetizing. I have to force myself to drink kombucha sometimes. However, the most ideal way to treat dysbiosis in your pet is with species-appropriate microbiome restorative therapy. What this means is administering the entire microbiome from a healthy patient of the same species, and this is done in the form of poop. Yay, poop. So how is microbiome therapy administered? Well, it's administered in basically one of two ways. We can give it orally, just like a pill. We have found, or some of our clients actually have found, it's a little easier to freeze it and then maybe put it inside of a chunk of meat. If you freeze it for a short time, it really doesn't, doesn't affect the bacteria much. If you freeze for a long time, you can kill them. In other words, over, over three, four weeks. But for a short time, it doesn't really do much. Um, we also have given it rectally in the form of a retention enema. When we give it rectally, we typically will clean out the colon or actually sterilize the colon with some infused ozone gas beforehand. We have found this to be especially helpful, uh, useful in our patients with severe diarrhea that maybe has not responded to other treatments. For what conditions can microbiome therapy be helpful? Many, many conditions. Basically, any condition that involves an unbalance of the immune system. Because well over 75% of the immune system is located within the gut, proper balance of beneficial versus pathogenic bacteria is vital to get the immune system back into balance so that it will react appropriately rather than inappropriately. So here's, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are many things that we have used microbiome therapy to help treat inflammatory bowel disease, cholangiohepatitis, which is inflammation of the liver and biliary system, gastroenteritis, which is inflammation of the stomach and or intestines, colitis, which is inflammation of the colon, allergies, immune deficiency, immune-mediated diseases where the immune system is overreacting, and that's anything from immune-mediated arthritis to possibly more severe conditions like immune hemolytic anemia or ITP. I would not use it as the sole treatment for those, but can be helpful. Perianal fistula, cancer, resistant GI infections in humans. It has been used successfully. We even have a client who uh, has had this uh, successfully to treat antibiotic-resistant Clostridium difficile. And of course, it can be used to help with leaky gut. I want to take a few minutes to talk about some cases where we've had success using microbiome therapy. The first one is Bubba. Bubba is a now six-year-old male neutered Doberman. And starting sometime in mid-2014, Bubba began vomiting, and he developed elevated liver enzymes that went very, very high. I don't have the exact numbers, but you'll hear in the client comments later how high they were. And the suspected diagnosis was copper-associated hepatopathy, which doesn't carry a real great prognosis to begin with. And the conventional treatment is somewhat costly, and, the, and this client was, was unable to, to do it. So she came to us seeking alternatives. He had been on many different conventional treatments, really without fixing his problem. So after three oral microbiome treatments and a change to a minimally or non-processed diet. These are the client's comments. From June 19th of 2015, via email, she says, Bubba has acted and felt better than ever since going through these treatments. Dr. Katz, I'm not sure if you realize this, but Bubba's blood work has never been good for the past 12 months. This all started in May of 2014, and ALT has been anywhere from 500 to 6,000. Normal for this value is somewhere in the range of 50 to 150, and his was 122 right then. In December of 2015, she gave us some more comments. The fact that so much time has gone by and he continues to do well is proof how well the microbiome helped. He's truly a success story. No vomiting, appetite is great, he looks better than he ever has. Yay, Bubba. The second case I want to tell you about is a dog named Libby. 
Libby is a five-year-old female spade, long-haired uh, German Shepherd mix. And she had this condition, this nasty condition called chronic perianal fistula. And there really is no good conventional treatment for this, although sometimes long-term use of something called cyclosporin, which is an immune modulator medication, helps. But it's very expensive. They need to be on it for a long time. It can cause gastrointestinal upset. It's, it's not my first choice. But that, that little gross picture on the right there is kind of what a perianal fistula looks like. It's basically a hole next to the butt. It's a ooey, gooey, yucky, nasty thing. And Libby had had many conventional and several alternative treatments with limited success. These alternative treatments had we had tried included homeopathy, herbs, and, and she had been on conventional antibiotics, but her problem just kept coming back. She started getting microbiome in May of 2015. She got her second dose, I think, a few weeks later, and since then she's gotten one dose every one to three months. And she's doing well, and her fistulas have not come back. Her mom's exact words were, you wouldn't know it was the same butt. So we're very happy for Libby. I threw in a slide here with just some questions I thought might come up about microbiome therapy. So the first question is, how many doses are needed? And this is really going to vary depending on your pet's diet, the level of stress due to lifestyle or other diseases. Diseases can be a cause of stress and their medications. Of course, if, if a pet is on some sort of antibiotic, it's, it's going to negate that a little bit and they're going to need more repetition. Even heartworm preventative can function as an antibiotic and may alter the gut bacteria slightly. I'm not telling you to stop giving heartworm preventative, I'm just saying, be aware. Typically, though, we start with three doses about three to seven days apart. For pets on processed diets, more frequent future repetition may be needed. Second question, if my pet is having diarrhea, won't an enema make it worse? While it may seem counterintuitive to administer a retention enema to a patient having diarrhea, we actually have not seen any instance where the patient pooped it right out. We've actually had patients go home to find that their next bowel movement is greatly improved and sometimes even normal. Can I just feed my pet my friend's dog's poop? Well, you can feed your, your dog or your pet, your, your friend's pet's poop if you want. But if the microbiome doesn't come from a healthy patient with proper species appropriate diet, minimal disruption to their GI tract, and no recent history of antibiotics, it likely will not help them. And if the donor has any health issues, including obesity, your pet may develop them. There is a case of a woman who received microbiome therapy from her overweight daughter. And the woman who never had a weight problem her entire life became overweight after receiving this microbiome treatment from her daughter. So it can happen. These other questions I just thought were kind of interesting because they relate a little bit. So why do dogs sometimes try to eat poop? There's lots of different possible reasons. Your dog may be telling you, hey, I'm missing something here, meaning that their diet may be incomplete or they may have dysbiosis. Remember that we can test for this, though no test is 100% accurate. So if it's negative, it's not a guarantee that they don't have imbalance. Your dog may not be properly assimilating or digesting their food due to some inherited digestive deficiency. We can also test for some of these. It could be a habit due to being confined and not wanting to be in a dirty cage. We sometimes see this uh, in puppy mill dogs. Or they may be trying to hide the evidence if they have an accident in the house. Shame, shame. And this other question I thought was interesting. Why do dogs sometimes eat grass? And while nobody truly has the answer to this, my theory is they do it because their stomach is upset and the grass has a buffering uh, antacid type effect. Some dogs will actually vomit a few minutes after eating grass. In fact, my dog does that occasionally. Uh, and therefore, it could be that the grass has this emetic or 
vomiting effect. But remember that signs and symptoms are the body's way of trying to fix something that's out of balance. And symptoms are not always best to be suppressed unless they're immediately life-threatening. And if, if your dog is eating grass, then microbiome therapy can help. So who are the donors? I'm sure you're dying to know. The canine donor is Sarah. She's an approximately five-year-old female spade pit bull. And the only injury or illness that she's ever had was a broken leg when she was somewhere around nine months old. And that was how I came to adopt her because she ran out of time and nobody else claimed her. She was supposed to be a foster. But she ended up getting very attached to me. <laughs> she's fed a completely raw diet by Northwest Naturals. For treats and snacks, she gets freeze-dried beef, chicken, or turkey, as well as freeze-dried liver. She will sometimes get raw chicken thighs, gizzards, or chicken necks. And she's only vaccinated for what she absolutely needs. And her titers have shown that she has protective immunity to distemper and parvovirus. She likes to spend time outside and make sure she gets plenty of sunshine. When it's nice, she and I go for walks and jogs. And the feline donor is Aragorn. He's a three-year-old neutered male domestic short hair cat. And I have raised him since he was just a few days old, somewhere around four or five days old. Didn't even have his eyes open. He was bottle fed then, but now he eats a mostly raw diet with some high quality meat based canned food. He's never had an injury or illness in his entire life. And though he's an indoor cat, he spends very short amounts of time outdoors with uh, supervised when the weather's warm. He is also minimally vaccinated and has never received antibiotics. He loves to lay in the sunshine in the house, and he also loves to chase creepy balls and feather toys, as well as to harass his feline companions. Sorry, I have a dog right here. He is a bit of a troublemaker. Yes, he is. I'd like to take this time to entertain any other questions. Wouldn't the bacteria be destroyed by stomach acids? Some of them likely are, but the sheer numbers, that you're guaranteed that some are going to survive. There's just too, too many. So good question. Any other questions other than cost? Comments? You liked it? You didn't like it? Too much focusing on poop? Um, it's okay if you guys don't have questions. I also wanted to just remind everyone that we're seeing appointments a few days per month at Bark Bus Depot in Naperville. Um, and there's also a plan in the works by the end of the summer to start seeing patients in St. John, Indiana at, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the place. I'm drawing a blank. Hungry Hound. Hungry Hound. <laughs> okay. So I have a kitten in my lap, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Somebody, Someone said very interesting, so that's good. Well, I'll, I'll hang on here for a few more minutes. Uh, if, if you do think of a question later that we didn't answer, go ahead and email us and we will get you the answer. Um, hope you enjoyed the webinar. The little kitten really, really wants to get off my lap, so I'm going to put him on the floor. Yeah. Do I recommend giving probiotics long term or only for a limited? Probiotics are really good. And, and probiotics are manufactured, and maybe that's not the right word, in, in such a way that they are formulated to, to, to maybe better withstand the, the stomach acids. But we, we have found that uh, we, we have very, effects, very good effects giving it orally because, as I said before, just the sheer number of bacteria, some of them are, are bound to, to withstand. Yeah. Okay, one client is saying that, that their dog got improvement with her stools from the microbiome. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yeah. Okay, is it ever good to be used as preventive care like a once a year type of thing? Lisa's asking. Hmm. Well, once, once a year is 
probably not enough if, if your pet is on a processed food that, that's causing this subclinical inflammation because that's really what is adversely affecting the, the bacteria. And, and also, interestingly enough, in, in humans, it's, it's, it's also processed foods, but it's refined sugar as well. So that, that act, you know, feeds sort of more the bad bacteria than, than the good. I've been doing a lot of reading on that because I'm hoping to change, change my, my gut bacteria for the better. So. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next month when we're going to talk about homeopathy. So if you're curious at all about homeopathy, please join us on the last Tuesday of next month. I don't have the date right in front of me. It's probably June 30-something. Um, it will be June 28th. All right. Thank you. Good night.